and, and honestly, it might sound, I think the challenge as a new dog owner is you don't quite understand the relationship between the problem and the solution. Yeah. You certainly don't see the relationship between the problem and another problem mm-hmm. or a totally different solution that might not even make sense at first, but when you dive into it, you're like, aha, this mm-hmm. is the realization I had as a student when I came to McCann Dogs, when I was learning all sorts of things about leadership and uh, good information timing, mm-hmm. which is something that we're going to talk about tonight. Good timing can solve a lot of your problems, but understanding when, why, and how to apply that good timing in your training can make a big difference. Things like pulling on leash, uh, what else? Barking, jumping up, uh, digging in the yard, all those things where you're Ignoring like, Ignoring you, not coming when they're called. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, these common frustrations that you have. We're going to give you some strategies to break down, to identify the problems and then break them down by the end of tonight's show. You're going to be a bit of an expert at how to, what the, the changes that you need to make to make your pup more successful. Because Here's the good news is that they're capable of uh, figuring it out with good information. Here's the bad news. And quickly. Yeah, here's the bad news, is that they're learning all the time. Mm -hmm. And whether you're giving them good information or not, they're starting to figure things out for themselves. Mm So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And the good and the bad news, because it's both, is that everything depends on you. (laughs) Totally. Your dog is only going to be as good or as bad as the information or the training that you give them. So the more educated you can be, the better off your dog will be. So you're already doing a great thing. By being here with us for the next little bit. Which is why you're here and we're excited to have you. Now, you you might be, I know there's a lot of new people in the chat I saw, and uh, this might be your first McCann dog training video with us. You know, uh, we have, uh, we feature some uh, amazing dog trainers from our um, staff and very accomplished, very successful. They have tons and tons of experience. McCann Dogs has been uh, training dogs for more than 40 years. and. Mm We train more than 100,000 dogs in our training facility every week. We get to see more than 500 dogs in the building. And uh, our uh, incredible group of trainers are helping people work through exactly the same challenges that you have. And sort of a byproduct of that or, or, you know, something that we gain from it is some of that, uh, the knowledge uh, and experience as we have these conversations, you know, in the kitchen or in Mm -hmm. passing at the Mm -hmm. training facility, which helps us to refine the message for you today. And we're excited to share that with you. Now, um, Mm -hmm. again, if this is your first time, I'm Ken Steep. This is Kale McCann. We're professional dog trainers at McCann Dogs. And in tonight's show, we're going to talk about three dog training steps to stop any unwanted behavior. Welcome back to McCann Dogs. So, so buttons. Um, Are you... Are you skipping your romper room to save time, or do you, are you? Yeah, I thought okay. we got we got off a little bit late. Yes. I mean, let's let's do that. Let's do that just for fun. Maybe like a quick a quick version. Yeah, really quickly. Uh, I'd love to know where you're joining us from. Um, we have uh, students from all over the world. I think we have uh, 68 countries represented mm, in our, 70. F- from our online training students. And it's so cool to hear about people from these like really unique places mm-hmm. um, who have very common challenges. And um, I mean, again, we've talked about good news, bad news. The good news is that um, you're not alone. You know, there are people just like you in places from all over the world who are going through the, exactly the same struggle. And uh, we're helping them uh, you know, to have a well-behaved dog. Um, but right now is the time for you to let us know exactly where are you joining the mm-hmm. train station from. I think it's important to say, too, like we talk a lot, obviously, when we're doing our um, live streams and our YouTube videos and stuff, we refer to all of our online training, um, which is fabulous. We have a really great program. Um, but we also have a pretty amazing um, in-person facility in Flamborough, Ontario. I think a few people asked where our actual training center is located. So uh, believe it or not, we're Canadian, despite what um, people think. We're from a small town in Canada. Canada, and uh, we have a really great facility and um, it's open for people to come in and check out classes so if you're ever in the area or you're traveling by um, come in and visit us and one of our uh, people will show you around the place pretty I cool see people joining us from Napa East Lansing Toronto not too far away I see a couple people from Toronto Southern California Texas uh, St. Paul Minnesota North York uh, Brussels uh, Alberta London Brooklyn nice. near Traverse City Michigan thanks for joining us Kathy uh, Severn Ontario uh, Oregon 
Quebec City, Lake City, Florida, Roseville, Utah, Memphis, Tennessee, Savannah. We just came back. I uh, was doing some YouTube stuff in Utah a couple of weeks ago now. Mm -hmm. And we were there when it was like 107 degrees or something like that. Oh, Fahrenheit, gosh. I think. Um, yeah, it was really hot. But uh, Utah is beautiful. Um, Nashville, Boston, or near Boston, London, England. Thanks for staying up late with us, Nova. I know it's a little bit later there. Memphis, Colorado Springs, Cannon City, Idaho, Texas, and Desert Hot Springs. Cool beans. Thanks for joining us tonight, guys. So first things first, we need to talk a little bit about how to, what your expectation should be for your dog if you're dealing with a problem behavior. Mm -hmm. Actually, this would be a good time for you to let me know. Uh, what's the, what, if you could fix one thing tonight, if you have one challenge that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't take this anymore. I have to fix this thing. What is it? Pulling on leash, jumping up, uh, recall, uh, response, to, like what is that thing? Drop it in the chat um, because we can, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what your expectations could be, should be, um, but we're also going to talk about a couple other steps to, that you're going to need to apply to this problem that you've got and, and, and how you can sort it out. Sky says we definitely sound Canadian. Oh, no way. Eh? <laughs> it's so funny because we don't think we sound that Canadian in comparison to other parts of our country, but I guess if you That's compare true. us to others, yeah, it's pretty easy to well, tell. Well, you just gave back... I say a coast. a lot as well. You just came back from the East Coast yes. where uh, you were very successful in, during the national championships yes. in dog agility. Yeah. Uh, why don't we talk about that for just a moment? Yeah. Well, last week I was over in New Brunswick, uh, which is on the, com well, not complete other side of the country, but pretty far away. Um, and myself, along with a whole bunch of the McCann agility students, were competing at a huge national event and also a tryout for Team Canada uh, for 2024, uh, which is exciting. So um, I was lucky enough to do quite well with my little Border Collie Beeline. Um, we won several of the events and got chosen for the team. So we'll be heading to the Netherlands in May next year to represent Canada. So it was um, it was pretty good. They competition was great. The drive home was a little eventful <laughs> with our car breaking down and us having to navigate that with a bunch of dogs with us, but um, it turned out to be pretty fun. <laughs> it's good. Um, I noticed a lot of you guys are struggling with um, the same thing. Yep. Uh, now there's a lot of barking. I see a lot of biting, uh, nipping and biting. And it's interesting that a lot of these would come up uh, tonight. Curious uh, to know the age biting. of the dogs who yeah. are nipping and biting. Yeah, that's good information for help to help us um, guide the guide the conversation a little bit. So let's talk about the first thing that you need to assess, decision you need to make when you're dealing with a problem behavior. And um, we'll talk specifically. Maybe we'll just take. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about two of these problem behaviors just to sort of give it a little bit of like shape. Yeah. Yep. Um, let's talk about nipping and biting as the first one and uh, and pulling on leash because that seems to be the most common thing. You can apply this if you're dealing with jumping, barking, all this other stuff. Um, you can apply these same uh, rules um, to, to, your, to that training. But let's talk a little bit about establishing your expectations in the foundation and fairness, which is your first point, foundation and fairness, about what the dog understands. Mm -hmm. and how you're going to work through that. Yeah, so we'll start with um, leash pulling first, just because I think it's more broad for all ages of dogs. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the expectation, you do need to sort of have a kind of have a realistic expectation of um, what your dog uh, should and could do depending on their age. So, you know, we can talk a lot about puppies. It looks like there's some younger dogs in the chat, but a lot of what we say honestly can be applied to any age of dog. When we're giving advice, we don't often restrict the, um, the information to the age of the dog. Often it has to do with uh, how much training the dog has had or not because you can have a 12 month old dog that's had no training and they're sort of at the same foundational level as a puppy they totally. might be you might handle it a little bit differently but the expectation will be the same because they don't have the skills um anyways i digress with the um, leash pulling, we want to, you know, for example, an unrealistic expectation that people will have with puppies per se is that they get a puppy, they hook the leash on, and they go for a walk around the block. And it is horrible. The puppies are trying to pick this up, and they're trying to pick that up, and they're pulling towards this person, and they're jumping at this and whatever. And it's, it's a bit of a disaster. And then people will say, you know, walking my dog is just so hard. And, you know, it's 
when you know about dog training, you you look at that and think like, well, obviously. Uh, but when you don't really know and you just think you're doing the right thing, you know, taking your dog for a walk at a young age when you haven't gone through all of the foundational steps to train your dog to, to do the walking of course it's not going to go well Um, because they don't really know what they're supposed to do. You know, puppies and dogs aren't, they don't get dropped off at your house knowing how to walk perfectly on a leash without pulling or how to respond to their name or how to do anything really that's up to us to do it. And sometimes by accident, we end up putting our dogs in situations where we really shouldn't be expecting them to do the thing without us doing the foundational steps first. And I find leash pulling is one of the most common things because a lot of the time the problem is happening and the person either didn't know or hasn't done any of the foundational steps that we do that allows you to ease into being able to take your dog for a wonderful loose leash, you know, nice walk with your dog without all of the pulling and all of the gagging so um you know you want to make sure that you pass kindergarten before you go to university yeah that's so important it's not about the age it's about the level of understanding yeah. um and we will see f- comments in, in uh, on videos that say something like oh well that's great but this is this dog's already trained or uh hey try try yeah. that with a wild and crazy dog which is the worst decision that you could make taking a dog that's already struggling with some kind of control and attention and putting them in a situation that is definitely going to overface them. This is why you're not going to practice leash walking if you can't get any attention. Mm -hmm. Attention is the starting point. We've um, talked a little bit about this in a few probably leash walking videos uh, where the first win, specifically with leash pulling, the first win you need to get is before you even leave the house. Maybe it's in your landing. Maybe it's in your hallway in your apartment. maybe Maybe it's in your kitchen. Whatever that is, you have to be able to get some attention from your dog before you begin that walk. Um, Having a solid foundation is really important. Mm -hmm. And as you build this building up, you know, the found, you do some groundwork. You're teaching your dog to um, understand that food is valuable. You're teaching your dog to follow food. You're starting to introduce them to, you know, more challenges and distractions as you work on your leash walking training, but you're not taking them for a walk to the park. That's not the goal. At the beginning, you need to focus on foundational Mm -hmm. skills. And uh, so let's talk about, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I could could run you through very quickly um, just some more specific examples of what we mean with walking. Um, We have um, a puppy that's approaching two. I guess we can't really call him a puppy anymore, but I guess he's a puppy until we get another puppy. But um, one of the things that we did with him before we started actually walking him around the around the block is we started his leash walking training in the kitchen because there was no distractions. There was hardly anything going on. Um, we could control the environment around him. And he was a rock star in the kitchen because we had the treats and we were showing him and everything was great. Then we worked to the hallway. Then we worked in and around different rooms of the house with him beside us. Then we would do the same thing and then let the other dogs be around. So we had to bypass our other dogs. We had a cat at the time when he was a puppy. Um, So that's sort of what we worked. From there, though, I didn't just then say, okay, let's go for a walk around the block. We then moved to, you know, initially, honestly, being able to stand outside my front door at the top of our steps and have him sit on a loose leash and look at the world around him without yeah. running down the steps or trying to bark at the people that are going by. We just literally worked, sit on the steps, on a loose leash, check in with me, be calm. And once he learned that, then we practice walking in the driveway. You can see where I'm getting at here. Baby steps, and I would move on to the next next step once I could see that the first step was going really well. And it wasn't just step, 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 step going, I would, you know, like I said, we would work in the house, but there would be no distractions around. Then we would keep the same skill, but then we would add the distractions. So I could, for example, work my way to the driveway and I could be great in the driveway, but before I go for a walk, maybe Ken comes out with another dog or maybe he bounces a tennis ball in the driveway and I see if I can navigate my dog away from that distraction. So that mimics, you know, seeing a dog behind a fence when we're at a walk or whatever it might be. So We try to think about setting up the scenarios so that when we get out to do the thing, we have the skills to do the thing because we've already worked that. I already have an idea of what my dog's triggers might be and I can be more proactive. I can be a good leader. I can give my dog good information, but we take baby steps and we outline all of this stuff in our programs, but that's sort of like the Coles Notes version of the process on how we would do it without going through the individual steps. I think that's 
maybe one of the challenges, you know, when you're just skimming through YouTube yeah. and uh, you're getting sort of broken information from different resources mm -hmm. where a guided program gives you directly and says, for your dog, this is the right step. Yeah. Um, but taking, we have all kinds of information on YouTube that talks about management and management is going to be a critical step in your foundation and fairness. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about a house line. We often refer to it as a puppy house line, puppy training house line, but it's a house line for any dog in training. doesn't matter how you refer to them, whether they're a puppy or an adult dog. If you're working on something, you have to be able to manage the dog appropriately. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people in here are struggling with nipping and biting. And in terms of foundation and fairness, your puppy has just, if it's a puppy, has just left their litter. And that's how they interact with one another. It's mm -hmm. playful. It's bouncy. And then for us to have an expectation that this dog just isn't going to bite when they come because I'm a human and I, I'm their owner and like they, uh, I feed them and I buy beds for them and I do the things um, is unrealistic. So being able to manage that puppy appropriately is a critical step. Let's talk about, you know, what we use when we have a puppy in training who's nipping and biting. And, and I'll, I'll be quite frank here. Nipping and biting doesn't last very long in our household mm -hmm. because we have great timing. We, t we talk about how we're going to talk about some of the things uh, a little later on, some of the elements of each skill, each, each problem solving mm -hmm. uh, step that you're going to take. Yeah. But we understand the foundation that we're, we've got to start at the ground level here mm -hmm. and then build up from there. Yeah. So essentially when we're trying to navigate the nipping and biting phase with, um, with young dogs, we kind of have two avenues that we do hand in hand with one another. Number one, we do prevention. So we make the proper preve preventative um, steps to ensure that our dogs aren't, the first thing on their mind isn't gonna be to nip and bite because we are preventing it from happening. So in situations where you know they could nip and bite, we have a leash on or we're training them or they're in a crate or whatever the situation might be. But obviously puppies cannot live their entire life attached to a leash with treats on their nose totally. or in a crate. So the second avenue would be the training that we do that establishes ourselves as a leader. And what people don't know is that when you teach your dog to do a sit stay, you're also at the same time teaching your dog not to nip you. When you teach your dog to come when they're called, you're also at the same time teaching, teaching them not to nip you. Um, I literally could go on and on and on with examples yeah. here, but what I'm getting at is that when you start to show your dog that you're worth listening to, puppies and dogs don't want to nip and bite at somebody who they feel is of higher value than them, is their leader. They don't nip and bite leaders. That's just, that is dog talk. That's just what happens. So when I start to assert myself, and I'm not talking negative, I'm not talking correction, I'm not no. talking any yeah, of that. Everyone hears, hears that and they're like, leader, yeah, like, come down, no. iron fist. I just not mean the like, case. Say, meaning what I say and saying what I mean, following through. If I say sit, I don't say it 10 times. I make it happen and show the dog what I want them to do. I'm being a teacher. I'm being a, help, a helper to make sure that the dog listens. Because the dog doesn't hear all of these things over and over, I don't say things three times and then start to get angry with my voice. I don't uh, portray that type of stuff with the dog. I just do the thing. And if they don't know how to do it, I help them. Or if they're being a bit of a Dinkelheimer Sch Schmidt in the moment, then I'll then make it happen and I'll do it very calmly. And the dog goes, oh, I guess I have to listen to that thing. And then the more you do that, the less the dog wants to nip and bite. So um, <laughs> there's so much more detail, obviously, that we can go into about this, but that's sort of the... The cream of the crop there, I think a lot of people think, well, how do I correct the nipping and biting? Obviously that there are ways to do that, but what people don't realize is that they're missing the other things, the training and the prevention. And if they would get better at those things, you don't have to do the corrective stuff as totally, much, which totally. is the ultimate goal at the end of the day. Absolutely. And and talk when we're talking about management, um, whether it's a skill like leash walking, you need to have your dog on a line. I know someone had mentioned, let's see What's here. a house line? No, uh, what I saw was, what's the best way for you, uh, uh, Massey Lee, what's the best way for your, uh, your dog, teach your dog to come to you when they're not on the lead? Good, good question. Great question. You don't let them have that opportunity to make the wrong choice. That's what leadership's all about. Mm -hmm. you, you have a sense of what their level of understanding is. Leash walking, you don't over, overface them with distraction. Nipping and biting, you don't let them get wild and crazy without some way of reeling them in a little bit. Uh, teaching your dog a recall or response to name, you don't allow them offline mm -hmm. if you can't back it up with some training. As we mentioned at the top, if your dog's getting a sense, if your, your dog's learning that they don't have to respond sometimes, sometimes they do, 
That's so confusing for them. So make mm-hmm. sure that the o- they don't even know that not responding is an option. You're managing them with a leash or a long line. In the house, it's a mm-hmm. house line. You're setting them up to make the right choices. That way they think this person is, this human is brilliant. Uh, this human can like stop me from doing the things that I don't want to do. That management is foundational. And, and it's only fair to put your dog in a situation where you can manage them well. I want to tell you guys a bit of a secret. So with this management, you know, people often say, okay, the leash is on. He's saying don't take the dog off leash. And then what people end up doing is they end up holding the leash or holding the house line or right. holding the long That's line. True. And they think, well, obviously the dog's good. I'm holding the leash. But how do I get from this to that? So we go over this step by step by step in complete progression in our programs. But I'm going to tell you now that when we're training with a leash, we don't have a tight leash if you can believe it. Right. Because training your dog to listen with the leash on, but the leash being loose is what leads you to the point where you can actually have the dog off leash because dogs become leash wise. When they feel tension on their collar all of the time and then all of a sudden you take the leash off, they go, oh, I feel free, I don't have to listen anymore. So the secret is teaching them to listen on leash without them feeling like they're on leash and there's way more about how to actually get that done but that there is what most people miss in their training that's a great takeaway for anybody who's training a dog right now Mm -hmm. uh, at home uh you know um understanding that you're you're sitting your dog up to make the right choice Mm -hmm. you're making your dog think that it's up to them but you're there if they make the wrong choice you can guide them away you can manage them you can stop them from um you know getting into trouble getting hurt that is a really important point a house line, up. a house line, guys, is a, a line or a leash that is worn in the house. It's it's on all of the time that the dog is in the house. When they're out of their crate, we cut the handle off so it slips and slides through the, um, uh, I almost said equipment because my brain's on agility, um, through the furniture. And it's used with supervision for dog safety and for control. And it allows you to stop any unwanted behavior while establishing good leadership and having great timing. Yeah, we, um, we will suggest people to go to like the dollar store get a super cheap leash uh cut the loop off um but we, we found sell, we sell really good ones yeah we found here? that yeah we found that the clips are um what's the word i'm looking for not they're, Cheap. Not, very, they're not very trustworthy so yeah. we actually ended up making a purpose-built house line mm-hmm. that's got a little like flat tab there so if you're Dog gets into something, you're getting into trouble, you can actually step on it and it stops. Mm-hmm. But we sell these on our store if you can go check that out, McCandogs.store. But this is a this is a house line. This thing is gonna change the and way you train light. dogs. They move around Super and light. Yeah, yeah, there's honestly the secret to dog training. <laughs> I wanted to get to this. Um, I just pulled a clip from a video when I was on the train on my way in and then I airdropped it in here. So uh, if you um, are paying attention to Oh, that um, this is going to talk That's a little a bit really about really nice face that you've paused. I know on. this is going to talk a little bit about beautiful. fairness, but I think it's valuable for you <laughs> where you are right now with your dog training. Kill uh, speaks a little bit to using food in training, but it's not all about the food. I want you to think bigger than that. I want you to think about in think about fairness in your training. What situation are you putting your puppy or young dog in training in that where you're you're giving them a little bit too much challenge? So I want you to check this out. There are some people that say they have dogs that are not interested in working for food. And there is some truth to that. There are some dogs that aren't naturally motivated by food, but we have nearly 500 dogs that come through our training school each week and we teach all of them how to work for food. So if your dog's not that motivated by food, I want you to consider three things. Number one, is your puppy or dog just not hungry? Maybe they've been eating all day, you've been free feeding them and they just don't really find the food that valuable or important. Or maybe are they just literally not hungry because they've already had their breakfast or their their lunch and they have a small stomach and they can't let me know in the chat who's got a dog that uh if they get in certain training situations won't take food or isn't interested in food or maybe you've just decided well my dog's not really interested in that uh in food and training in general 
eat a lot, you might have to change how much you feed in a day in order to build up a little bit more motivation for food. The second thing could be environment. Are you trying to train in an environment that's just too distracting so your dog is really stimulated or overwhelmed by what's happening? It, could they be um, worried or unsure in that environment? A lot of dogs will not really be interested in eating food if they're feeling stressed or they're feeling a little bit nervous. So you do need to consider your environment and making sure that your dog is actually comfortable in where they're working or not overstimulated or distracted. Um, and then also consider how well they know the skill. Maybe you need to backtrack a little bit to make things easier. And number three, have you actually taught your dog how to work for food at this point. Teaching the dogs to follow food is actually one of the very first things that we do with our puppies when we bring them home. It seems like such a simple, natural thing for puppies to do, but believe it or not, you actually have to teach your puppy how to follow food, how to work for food. Um, and you need to do that very slowly and gradually when your puppy is young, without any distractions around, so they really get the game. Let's Look at that puppy, he's so cute. So, uh, you know, I think that's that's sage advice for anyone who's struggling with a um, leash walking, anybody that's struggling with a recall, anybody that's struggling with anything where you're putting your dog in a situation where they're like, meh, I don't know, I'm not really interested in you, I'm not really interested in your toy, I'm not really interested in food. You can sort of um, consider a lot of those things. Are you putting your dog in a situation where they're overfaced? Does your dog have any idea what their name means? How much time have you put in teaching your dog to respond appropriately to their name without even overusing their name by saying it all the time, you know, and so in, then what happens is you end up watering it down because you say it so often and you don't actually expect your dog to pay attention to you. If I'm saying, Spot, come here, Spot, sit, Spot, get on your bed, Spot, blah, 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 over and over and over and over again, now Spot doesn't mean anything. So it's really important that you're mindful about how you're using the command as well so that you don't teach your dog just to ignore you. Um, Monty Mole, uh, my dog doesn't care about uh, one of our heart dog supporters. My dog nice. doesn't care uh, when there are other dogs barking, doesn't really care about treats. There's a couple of videos I think that would be good for you, Monty Mole. Maybe uh, lots of links can drop them. Actually, from that video, that video might be good for them um, to understand uh, the value of food. Also, when to bring out toys in your training. I think we talked about that in that video. If not, there's definitely a video where we talk about switching out rewards in, a, in situations like mm -hmm. that. But understanding that there's, there's ground level training that needs to happen. Your dog needs to know, have some idea of how to walk a short distance before you test them and walk any farther. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's important. Foundation and fairness. Are you being fair to your dog? The next thing that we have to, you have to consider with your dog's nuisance behavior or, or problem is timing. I will tell you the amount of people that complain about their dogs barking in the yard um, <laughs> is amazing. But do you ever stop to consider that the dog has no idea that they're doing anything wrong? They're just doing dog stuff. Yeah, it's pretty self uh, self rewarding to bark for your dog. Feels good, um, and and we have this expectation that like, well, I mean, every time I put him out in the yard, uh, when when we leave the house, we get a call from the neighbors, or every time I put him in the backyard and I go to practice my piano or deal with the kids' homework, the dog starts barking. Well, how does your dog know not to do that? Is it because you come to the back door and shout, hey, knock it off, after they barked, you know, seven, eight, ten times? That's not good timing. Mm -hmm. So we have to talk a little bit about uh, situations where your timing needs to be better when we're solving some of these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're having house training problems, timing is you got to be your greatest concern. Yeah. Digging in the yard. Um, honestly, leash pulling. The amount of people that I see that are out there and the dog's hitting the end of the leash and then they're like, okay, well, I better do something about this. I'll tell you why I, I get, I get, I'm invested in that. It's because that was me before I was, before I went to McCann Dogs to become a student. That's exactly what yeah. I did. You know, I would try to, I'd have, some desire to get the, my dog to walk well and I might walk for half the street or something when I was at home and then I'd let her pull me all the way back or I'd let her pull me all the way to the park thinking oh this is great I'm going to tire her out and then she'd walk nicely nicely on the way back mm -hmm. but I never ever was showing her appropriately how to do this right yeah. you know I just lowered my expectations too much and my timing was so poor because I wasn't giving her the good information all the time. Let's talk about timing in terms of uh, barking, uh, listening, it, a little bit. Yeah. Um, can we say this? Yeah. Because. Oh, yeah. Okay. Somebody had said, um, 
because we were just talking about food. Um, yeah, that's great. Do we have to work for food forever? And I'm so oh, I glad love this. Okay. somebody asked that. because Great question. It's a perfect segue. Also speaks to timing. So instead of going yeah. to the like the fixing part, let's talk about the uh, using food in your training timing problem. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are initially alarmed if they see our, a lot of our foundation training and they see how much food and positive reinforcement that we use. Some people think, well, that's fine and great, but like, I don't want to have to use treats in order to get my dog to listen to me, you know, forever. Yeah. And um, we love when people say that because yeah. we agree with you. We don't, we don't think a well-trained dog is a dog that is dependent on any type of tool. They should just want to listen to you because they love you and they enjoy listening to you. But we have to get there some yeah. way yeah. um and and using food as a motivator is um is a really good option uh, but here's where the, the dependence of food or the timing comes in you know if your dog's not listening to you and you think like oh he's not listening and you pull food out and shake the thing or you get treats to get them to listen well you will become dependent on the food because right. the dog says, if I don't listen a couple times, <laughs> yeah, yeah. watch what she does. She goes and she grabs that cookie and she begs me to come in. Um, Who's guilty of this? Yeah. Like it's, it's so common. You know, it you go is. to the backyard and you've let your dog out to go pee or whatever. Yeah. And scooter, scooter, nothing. Well, I guess I got to go get cookie, get the cookie bag. Yeah. <laughs> I see this all in. of the time when people want their dogs so to common. lie down. So they common. say, down, yes, down, yeah, down. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. They get a treat out and yeah. they lure the dog down. And the dog's just laughing at you inside saying, like, okay, bring out the treats. So that is sort of um, you repeat the command too much and then you pull out food and then you become dependent on it. But there's actually a more um, detailed thing that we can share with you as well, and that is the timing in which you reward food. So when we're trying to teach our dogs to listen without being dependent, on the food we are very conscious that when we're giving any type of cue physical cue or verbal cue that we're not presenting the food prior or at the same time as giving that cue because what will start to happen you know, if I ask Ken to do something for me and at the same time I was like for Ken I would be holding a cupcake he would do anything that I wanted because he says well she's holding a cupcake so chances are if I do that thing she's probably going to give it to me so if I'm trying to train my dog to do something and I get to the point where I don't want to depend on food anymore we use the food very um effortlessly in the early stages but mm -hmm. once I get to the next step and I have uh, food in my hand we try to make it a, um, a little bit less obvious by having the food away asking the dog for the skill and then presenting the food to follow through until the dog hears the skill and says i don't need that treat anymore i know what to do and then they start listening just to the voice so the timing and how you present information to your dog needs to actually be done in a calculated way so that you do not become dependent on the food same thing goes for the leash same thing goes for the house line whatever it might be so there's actually a, a dog training formula that we follow in the mccann method that that prevents you from becoming dependent on the food all while motivating the dog to listen in the first place yeah um there's a there's something we use so many people are familiar with the clicker is that five or funky whining i don't know okay um it's so many people so many people are familiar with the clicker and we actually use our voice we use the word yes to mark that great choice the great behavior that we want and that's a great way to um to scale out food to mm -hmm. to uh, create a positive association with a sounding in this case it's a word um, that's associated with the receiving of food but we've loaded all the value on the word and that's um, part of the training we've we had, we've published a few bit videos specifically on this topic um, it's a little bit it's a little bit nuanced so you know I don't think a lot of people would watch those have watched those videos mm. but I'll tell you the videos that those are the ones that you're gonna make the most ground on those where you really start to learn the mistakes that you're making mm -hmm. um, in your dog training with that said, we use the word yes uh, that starts to replace the food. Mm -hmm. It marks that moment in time. It marks the behavior for the dog. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's how we stop. It's never. It's not the donkey and carrot thing the whole time. At the beginning, that's great. At the foundation, you need it. Mm -hmm. But we want to get away from that because we want the dog listening to our voice, not necessarily whatever's in our treat pouch or in our and pocket. And if I can do a little circle back here to our very first uh, thing where we talked about foundation and fairness, Ken just brought up a really good point. It's not the donkey and carrot when we get to the point where we don't want to become dependent on the food. But if we look at people's track record of when they're doing the training and they you know, want the dog to listen without the food, often 
that person hasn't done the donkey and carrot right, phase. Right. And that's why the dog's not good. Or spent Be- through it. Yeah, because they haven't taken the time to put in the value of listening to that skill or doing that thing by making it dead easy and positive. And, and then from there, we move on to the next step. So we've got to do all of the different phases together in order to get the best results. So if we're skipping things, you're not going to get the reliability and the expectation that you really, truly could. It makes me think of a couple things. I think of that military saying, we say it in the fire service, and I know Instructor Carol said it as well. It is uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And um, sometimes if you feel like things are going horribly awry in your dog training or your puppy training, you need to slow down and take a look at what What's going wrong? Where is this all falling apart? Um, this might not apply to leash walking specifically because sometimes if you slow down, physically slow down, it gets way more challenging. So finding a good pace is important. But slowing down the process of like what's going wrong is gonna help you to be a little bit more uh, analytical and, and figure out what some of your challenges, which challenges really making things fall apart. Next thing we have to talk about. So we've talked about foundation and fairness. We figured out or you've decided that you're not going to uh, have too uh, have uh, too high of expectations of your dog who doesn't understand the skill or the behavior yet. You've decided that uh, you're going to teach them a foundation. So if it's if it's jumping up, teach teach your dog a sit at your side, an incompatible behavior. Mm-hmm. If if you if every time you go for a walk they're jumping like crazy on people, then you need to teach your dog to remain in at your side as people approach. Um, you know that having built so much value on that sit at your side, that has a million uses, a million and one uses, especially when it comes to leash walking. But teaching them that skill as a foundational introduction to leash walking or jumping up training or whatever is going to uh, put you in a good situation when you encounter an unusual situation Mm -hmm. on your walk Mm -hmm. because you've got that default behavior. But we have to talk about consistency. And consistency, yeah, this is a real challenge for a lot of people. And I get it, you know, some days- It's hard to be consistent. Yeah, some, some, some days you just, you just don't, feel like training. Some days you feel overwhelmed. Or Some you're days busy you're or you're busy. tired Absolutely. or you're whatever, annoyed or whatever yeah. it might be. And everybody goes through it. Even, you know, us as dog trainers, yep. it's impossible to be perfectly consistent all of the time. Yeah. And, and that's okay. But identifying that, having some alternative things you can do with your dog. So I, I love this one. People are, are, often say like, well, I mean, this dog is a wild thing in the house. What am I supposed to do if I'm not supposed to take them for a walk? Well, there's a million things you can do. Play a game of tug. Maybe play a game of fetch. Mm-hmm. Maybe do some restrained recalls, which I'll have uh, lots of links loot and drop in the uh, chat uh, of like doing restrained recalls. But that's the kind of burning off of energy, which is great. It's also super consistent because you aren't put, you aren't allowing your dog to rehearse the bad stuff. Are you going to say something? I was just thinking of that great video that we did quite a while back now where we did... Um, Ways to tire your dog out. I think we did it during COVID, actually. Ways to tire your dog out in the living room. Yeah. And it was like a small space, and we had like all kinds of fun things, and you didn't need a lot of skills to do it, but it was a great way. So if people couldn't walk their dogs, or you were stuck in that moment, was for other reasons. But, you know, if your dog's not trained yet to do, you know, walking, but you need an outlet to get some energy out, there are other things that you can do. um, And we have lots of videos on that that can kind of walk you through and give you some examples totally but that's the kind of consistency we're talking about you know it's um it's it can be challenging when you're like well what do i do next what do i do with my dog when this what do i do with my Mm -hmm. dog when that Mm -hmm. well if you sort if you have some um if you have an opportunity to have skills a plan uh which is where our life skills program or our puppy essentials program comes in uh perfectly is you have a plan you have a laid out structured plan that's appropriate for your dog maybe we can talk just briefly about that Yeah, there's definitely a great plan so you can kind of navigate the information and know like kind of where to do what. But I would say the biggest value of doing any program, whether it's online or whether it's in person with us, is we can tailor the program or adapt it for you and your dog once we get to know you and your dog. Because, um, you know, we have a McCann method that we teach, but it is not a one size fit all method. It works for all kinds of different dogs because we can make small tweaks for the person or for the dog to make sure that the job's getting done. Um, You know, how you would train a small, you know, 
worried or crazy energetic dog might be different than how you would train like a big boisterous dog um, or maybe a dog that's nervous or whatever. So there's lots of different things that we're going to do that we can tweak and it can be really helpful when you're getting guidance of an instructor to say, hey, I'm trying this and it's not working. What do I do? Well, if you're an online student, we can watch a video in about 30 seconds. We can say, your hand should be here. Your timing's a bit off. You should actually reward your dog, you know, in this position rather totally. than, and it's like, oh my gosh, now I can get, and then you can kind of get going from there. Um, so just the feedback of the instructors and the time in which you get it is instrumental in how much progress you're going to make and the support system that goes along with it. Yeah, I, it's, um, people will say like, well, I mean, what's different in your online training than your YouTube? Because it's I think, completely different. I know, I know it is, but yeah. these guys don't. I, you know, I think maybe that's offered in some places, is, yeah. you know, but there's actual, do- actual dog trainers that are overseeing your training mm-hmm. and are helping you through the process, which is what you desperately need. I had, so I went to, a, I'm not a golfer, but I I had a tournament with my, I worked for, uh, for the fire department as well. I, went, I had a tournament with my f- uh, crew and um, I would practiced hitting balls, hitting drives, which I don't, obviously, I think that's what it's called, hitting drives. Um, You're asking the wrong person. I know. And they would constantly like fade, I think, off to the right. I hit over and over and over again. I practiced more and more. As this tournament got closer, I was like, I have to get better. And then I had a lesson with a swing coach for about, I don't know, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, and it changed everything. So, you know, doing things over and over, even if the the amount of practice doesn't matter if you're not doing them right. Mm -hmm. And in a moment, I went from like, oh, he said I was chopping wood, which, you know, I guess I was like swinging in or something. And uh, it changed my swing entirely. Exact same thing with dog training. You can practice over and over and over again on what you think is the right thing, but a tiny tweak can make a world of difference. That's the benefit of uh, joining us online for your training. Yeah. Anyway, I, the spiel is over. And I, if you join online, you don't have to wait for a program to start. You literally can just start right. tonight. Yeah. Absolutely. And we'll see you in class on, on we have a live class um, every Monday, um, but the classes are seven days a week. It's, it's, it's all the time is the program, but you can start now. Yeah. Talking about get, bringing us back to consistency, uh, where, which so many people struggle with. I mentioned my situation where I would let the dog pull on half the walk. And this is also something I hear from people who are trying to teach their dog to walk on a loose leash. But, um, you know, half the walk goes great. And then as soon as we make the turn for home, uh, things fall apart. So what do you think you should do in that situation? Like, what are some immediate ideas you'd have for a dog that you want to teach them to walk on a loose leash but if you are going around the block the first half's great the second half is no good what if you reduce the distance what if we weren't worried about how big the walk was what if we focused on being really specific and critical of that nice leash walking at your side that's the kind of focus that we want from your dog And if instead of going around the block, maybe you go from light post to light post. Mm -hmm. Or if you're in the country, which I know. uh, Mailbox to mailbox. Right. Yeah. Mailbox (laughs) to mailbox. Maybe maybe it's, uh, you know, um, you're in a a, a parking lot in, in your in your apartment or wherever. Shorten the distance, but make sure it's great leash walking. Yeah. And focus on that. That's the difference. And and people who do that, it's so interesting, especially when we get students in class that I see like in our. In, in building, uh, that I see, I can almost tell right away, like they're going to be really mm-hmm. good about insisting that their yeah. their dog is listening, that their dog is doing the right thing. And also understand that like, you're going to have some rough days and yeah. you know, you just got to get a win and then get out. Um, but that cons- consistency is so important. Jumping up, nipping and biting. Let's talk about that. Nipping and biting the amount of um, people that I know there's a family and you're like, I don't know, my spouse, just loves when he chews on his hand or her hand. Like they don't care. They think mm-hmm. it's cute. And I'm struggling here. Um, it's important that you have a very honest conversation with that yeah. family member and say, listen, I'm working really hard to try to get this puppy to listen. And the one thing we're struggling with is nipping and biting. Now they said on this YouTube live stream, or they <laughs> said in my online class, or they said in my class, this is not good for the dog. We need to figure this out. I think that's the kind of conversation that you need to have because consistency is so important for your dog, especially during this impressionable mm-hmm. phase. Another situation where I see that is sometimes the, like, um, I'll see a dog's, a student's dog, like, gnaw on their arm or whatever, and I'll go over to assist them with it, and they'll be like, oh, no, 
he just has to go to the bathroom. He's just mouthing. Or yeah, he's just, you know, yeah. he's teething, or he just needs to go yeah. to the bathroom. And I think, well, do you want to be asked to go to the <laughs> go potty yeah. by him gnawing on your arm for right. the rest of his life? Like, we need to maybe choose a different communication avenue <laughs> than nipping and biting. But that's the consistency. If the, like, if you let your dog do that, and other times your grandmother's over and your puppy's gnawing on her arm, that's not okay. So we have to be black and white with dogs. And honestly, dogs appreciate that. They like when things are black and white. They don't like gray areas. They don't like sometimes rules. They like things to be clear so that they can go, okay, got it. Not allowed to do this, but I am allowed to do this. And if we can give them that with swift information and you know, positive reinforcement when they need it, but we can be consistent. You can really um, affect change quite quickly. Brian, I, I'm I, I'm I'm going to say this is in the nicest way, and I want this. I want you to take the, this away, like with a um, you know positive spin. And, okay, any tips on puppy biting, targeting face, cheeks, cheeks, chins, uh, double chins, noses and ears? Brian, you can't put your puppy in a situation where that can happen. Not right now. Yeah, Not your puppy right now. shouldn't be anywhere near yeah. your face to even let that happen. Absolutely. That might mean maybe you have the puppy up on the couch and you or you're getting down on the floor with the puppy, but you need to change the um, status, the... Uh, yeah, what well, just not for. allow your puppy up in those situations. Keep them away from your face. <laughs> yeah, right, really. or And don't get down on their level. The puppy yeah. sees that as a playful behavior. Mm-hmm. Your puppy thinks this is fun. Now, th- eventually, you're going to be snuggling. It's going to be the best. You know, maybe the puppy's oh, yeah. sleeping on your chest There's on the couch. There's a lot of snuggling that happens at our house. 100%, but not right now. Not while you're working on this. You're and working not, through if, they're, if they're making those choices, then we're not going to be um, doing those types of behaviors with our dogs. We want to make sure that we're establishing the rules first and our dog has a good understanding of um, elevation. Thank you, Albert. Um, we want to make sure our dog is uh, established about where it's supposed to be. Yes, I'm in bed. Okay, Brian. Yes, oh, okay. This is so common. Puppy, not on bed for now. Later, yeah. Sleep all you want with him, that's fine. But right now, I think puppy needs to be in a crate beside your bed if you want to so that you guys can be close together. We love that. We actually, when we raise our puppies for the first couple weeks, this is going to sound like a crazy dog person, but we love doing this. Also 21-time world champion of dog agility. And somebody who has dogs that absolutely loves her, and I absolutely love my dogs. Right, right. but I move everything off my bedside table and my dogs sleep, my puppies sleep in their crate beside my bedside table. So in they're liter- in a crate, literally beside me so that if they stir or if I need to get up, I hear them right away. And then from there, after a few weeks and we're sleeping through the night, which is usually happens within the first week, then down to the to the ground they go and they sleep in a crate beside our bed you know, for a long time before we feel comfortable with them, um, you know, sleeping out and knowing that they're not going to get any mischief. But um, you need to start that tonight, my friend. Yeah. Well, and I mean, honestly, it speaks to the consistency. Watch the video. We're doing it. Good yeah, job. Yeah, that's it. Great. Good um, job. That, that, that speaks to the consistency. Yeah. You know, if you're giving your dog sort of mixed signals about, okay, sometimes it's okay. And sometimes you can go on the bed. And, and uh, actually, what, we have a video somewhere. Somewhere I captured uh, Five Alive, like doing a puppy burn on a bed and, uh, mm. and and nipping and biting. And he generally wouldn't do that kind yeah. of thing. But that he elevation. He was in a scenario where it was easy for him to right, do it. That's yeah. right. Because it's fun. And I get it. Um, but and we may have been laughing because we were trying to get the video and we were like, oh my God, yeah. can you imagine but, if we let this happen all of the time? It would be right, awful. <laughs> right. But, right. Exactly. And, and I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. There's yeah. like, I can't wait for my puppy to sleep in my bed. We can't wait either, but we're going to make sure that they have the foundation and fairness that we've made sure yeah. that we've had good timing, giving them information, whether it's the right stuff. Good, yes, good boy, good girl, or uh, 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 leave that, knock it off, whatever, and that we've been consistent about the information. Yeah. The same thing, uh, I, I don't want to take us off on too many tangents, but I mean, potty training, jumping up, barking, digging, uh, uh, loose leash walking, I may have said that already, like all of these things require mm-hmm. consistency yes. in your training. And what what are those moments that you're, uh, you're seeing right now? You're like, oh, geez, you know what? I, I do let my dog jump on the whatever my neighbors because they love it and they love dogs well you can actually put that on a command and down the road when your dog has an understanding of when it's okay mm-hmm. that they're allowed to jump up actually you uh our puppy will jump from like 12 feet away up into kale's arms on a command uh, and i catch him and full speed like it yeah. is remarkable mm-hmm. but if we were struggling with him jumping up on us or other people that wouldn't happen 
that just wouldn't happen. We wouldn't let it happen. And we yeah. have a house line on to make sure it didn't happen. And Otherwise, you know what you can do is, you know, when you learn a little bit more about training, you can learn to use your neighbor as a reward. You yeah. know, if your dog is so excited to go see your neighbor, this is just a general scenario, um, instead of letting them drag you to them and then get pets, Make them sit on a loose leash for 30 seconds and then let them go get pets by your neighbor. So the dog's still getting that reward that they want, but they're doing something that's worthy of getting that reward instead of allowing them to rehearse the bad stuff. So we're not saying that you can't do the thing, but you want to make sure that you're not allowing the bad behavior to happen while you're doing the thing. That's totally. that's the point. <laughs> um, Debbie, uh, one of our heart dog members, uh, says, uh, my dog's scared in the car. He started to get better until he heard a loud motorcycle. Mm. Now she shakes and is a nervous wreck on car drives. Oh, sad. We talked a little bit about, uh, in a recent video, we talked about how to build value for your dog getting in the car. And using something like a crate can be a really valuable tool for this mm-hmm. kind of situation. Now, Debbie, this might be, you know, I don't want to give you information that put your dog in a tough scenario or put you in a tough scenario might be more appropriate for something like a private lesson. Mm -hmm. But um, I would start, if you can get a crate in your vehicle, that might be a good place to start because then your dog can be safe. Mm -hmm. They can't get into trouble and you can also start to load value on the crate being a really good place to go while they're on a car ride. Uh, And I just might add um, a tip that will be pretty safe for you to do once you've done what Ken suggested by having the crate. Start off by just having the dog go in the crate um, without turning your car on and leaving the house. You you can just have them go in and eat their meals or just get them having a positive experience going into the car area without the added stress of the engine being on or the movement of the car or whatever it might be. Um, Sadly, something like this does take a a while to fix um or to to improve because we kind of have to go at the pace um that's appropriate for the dog which it's all different for each dog um but it can be done but um yeah like ken said if you want a little bit more guidance you probably should work with somebody because they could help you with the pace uh sk arnold one of our heart dog members what about barking at new noises or sights around the home or the backyard Um, Well, this is something that um, it can be a challenge, uh, but often it shows that the dog maybe needs a little bit more socialization. And um, And what does that mean exactly? exactly. We should talk about what Um, that means. Environmental awareness. So I don't mean like going to the dog park and playing with other dogs. I just mean like experiencing things. Um, You know, when dogs are a little bit nervous about new things, we need to make more of a point of getting the dog out and about and doing things and giving them really good experiences. Um, That might be, you know, going and standing outside your local bank for a little while or, you know, go grab some ice cream with your dog and just let them like sit with you as you are out and people are kind of milling around and not really paying much attention to them. You know, more life experience is really going to be helpful. Um, The spooking or the reactions to the new noises, I would be um, hesitant to uh, be upset with the dog in those scenarios because the dog's just reacting to being a little bit unsure. The best thing to do in those situations is to redirect the dog's attention to something else. So um, call their name, get them thinking about their favorite trick. Um, Just do something that puts the dog in a different mental state and be aware. Obviously, we can't control every noise that may pop up up out of the blue. Um, But the more we can kind of check out the environment and ensure that we're putting the dog into a safe one will help minimize those situations. Yeah, I know quite a few people had uh, challenges with barking. We had a dog that we actually see it might have been euchre that we worked through like cars driving by and we'd work on like trick training playing tug doing something getting getting euchre to engage in a skill um i, I can't remember all the things we did but i do remember yep. like standing in a sit in at your side uh yep. in fr- while cars drove by and just rewarding her for making great choices like we did a whole video of attention um beside the road with her did we yep yeah um, Dan and I shot it together and, uh, it was, there was also, um, a lot of focus on, um, uh, cause she's not that food motivated do conquering that challenge with a dog that's not terribly food motivated. So it's actually a pretty good video. Yeah. That would be good if you have a dog that, yes, um, the driveway know, is, video, that's right. <laughs> is, uh, you know, uh, reacts in some of those, those situations. Cause as Kale said, if you can get them engaging in something else, they aren't thinking about like what that other uh, thing is. Um, and again, being with them, 
So mm-hmm. if your dog's barking at new things when you're not out there, when you're not out there, that's your fault. Yeah, you, know, you need to be out Don't there giving them, them great information. Take them out on leash with some treats or their favorite toy, or yeah. be armed with things that can help them. For sure. So when we're overcoming some of these challenges in your dog training journey because it's a journey you need to be considering the foundation and fairness does my dog understand this skill and am i giving them the appropriate amount of challenge in this situation you need to have great timing whether it's uh, the good stuff or the bad stuff your dog is always learning and in an absence of information they're going to assume that whatever feels good whatever tastes good is the right thing so you got to have great timing to give them that information and consistency um i can't express how important consistency mm-hmm. is it is so important to your dog training it's what undoes so many people's hard work is a couple repetitions of the dog not responding to their name the couple repetitions of the dog pulling down the street and then they mm-hmm. learn it's an option mm-hmm. um for those of you who uh, join us on a consistent uh basis just a little heads up um next month uh, ken and i are doing a bit of traveling so the train station is going to be a slightly different schedule but we'll post about when that will be but i just wanted to give you guys a heads up Kills off to another world. I am. I'm going to the Czech Republic for um, the largest agility world championship uh, in the world. And um, I'm nervous slash excited. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. I've trained. We're ready. So I'm we'll ex- see what happens. I, I don't know. I, I'm pumped, though. It'll be it'll be an interesting uh, experience. Yeah, I think you're going to enjoy it. You always do well when you're under pressure. So that's uh, exciting. It's going to feel weird if you win another one. I've said 21-time world champion of, of dog agility. Mm-hmm. So many times. I don't know. 22. I don't know. It doesn't have it doesn't the same ring. It feel the same. Yeah. So don't win a medal. So or, that or, win, so or win two of or them. Or win two. Yeah, that's 23 right. 23 <laughs> world. Yes. No, we'll be in Liberic, uh, Czech Republic, um, but Beeline's not won a medal yet. And she's like oh. my she's like my best trained dog really? I've ever had. But no medals yet. No, huh. I just I keep I keep messing up one little thing. Mm. So she's done well in Canada, but yeah. when we've gone overseas, one tiny thing has stopped us from getting a medal. So I'm hoping that this time Fingers is crossed. our time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you do you play music for your dog? We went on a trip recently, actually to a uh, an American Championships, and we have a sound sensitive dog. During that trip, we noticed how sound sensitive she was. The Airbnb mm-hmm. we were staying in, there was trucks driving by, and it was so noisy. Loud. She was really stressed out, and it was at that moment we decided we have to do something about this. Mm-hmm. So McCann Dogs has worked together with some music and content creators to create a playlist of music that is specifically for dogs with the right tempo and format and tones that like fill a space so that your dog can be relaxed and comfortable no matter where they are. We have unique uh, playlists. <laughs> if you check out Spotify and Apple Music, we have like playlists for dogs for thunderstorms if your dog's afraid of thunderstorms or fireworks we just have general playlists for like crate tra- crate training when you leave the house etc mm-hmm. at the end of tonight's show when i hit the uh end show button it's gonna offer you a chance to go check out the mccann dogs music channel if you have a dog who loves to it's more relaxed during music which most dogs are but mm-hmm. if you have a dog or you're playing music for your dog definitely stick mm-hmm. around to check that out i want to thank I wanna you guys i want to say one more thing uh instructor alexis who happens to be my sister, his sister-in-law. Um, this is her last train station That's true. for quite some time because she is going to be having a baby yeah. in just a few weeks. So if you guys can show her some love, yeah. we're going to miss her. We're going to have some new uh, yeah. McCann. The first McCann baby. Yeah, that's right. Very exciting. Very exciting. Anyway, so show Lexi some love in, in the chat because we're going to miss show her here. Show us some love. Yeah. That's it. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us, all of the uh, Team Heart Dog, all of our instructors. Uh, but the most important thing is with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest of my friends, well, that is up to you. 